name is Lara Newsom. I am a software engineering technical leader on the customer experience team at Cisco. I am also a panelist on the Angular Plus show. Uh, this is a podcast, all things Angular and Angular related. So definitely come work with me at Cisco and come check out the podcast. You can subscribe on any platform that you get your podcasts from. You can reach out to me on Twitter at Lara Nerdsome. My DMs are open. I do have uh, some like of some very small repos on my GitHub for this talk at L Newsome. And you can also go see a whole bunch of half finished stack blitz projects if that's what you're into. So the talk I have for you today is called cleaner unit testing with ciphers. So you'll be excited to learn that ciphers is yet another anagram that we get to use as software engineers. It stands for simple injectable functions, explicitly returning state. Now, this was uh, really first proposed by Moshe Kaladny in a 2019 article on Medium called Testing with Ciphers. Now, in this article, he goes uh, a little bit into the history of unit testing in JavaScript, how we kind of got to where we are today, and then really starts to dive into some of the problems that we have with unit testing and then proposes testing with ciphers as a way to sort of solve some of these issues that I'm pretty sure most of us have encountered. And what are those issues? Number one, have you ever had tests that pass only when run in a specific order? So this happens when you run a test. So if you run a test individually and it passes and then you run the whole test suite and all of a sudden that test is failing or you move the test like up a little bit in the test file and somehow it passes there. And that's because your tests are bleeding between each other, right? So that's no good. Um, are your test, is your test setup spread between multiple before each blocks? I know that I've come into several thousand line test files before and really struggled to figure out where my state is even being set up. So how do I even know what I'm testing, right? Which means that it's really hard to onboard new teammates to your test suite. So when I joined Cisco, uh, our tests were not in great shape. Uh, we've actually switched to using ciphers at Cisco. Um, and part of that was because it was really hard to onboard new developers because the test setup was so confusing. Like I love unit testing, like passionately love unit testing. And I hated writing unit tests when I first onboarded at Cisco because the test setup was really hard to understand. So what causes these issues? Um, the number one issue is mutating shared variables. That leads to those flaky tests. That's when you're seeing bleed through. So we'll get into how that happens in just a second. Um, it's also really easy to accidentally rescope a variable, and that makes for really difficult test failures to debug. And these multiple setup steps can make the code really confusing to follow and reuse. It can also make refactoring a lot more onerous. So if you've got to refactor your unit tests in four or five different places just to update a dependency or something, that's a lot of work to do uh, just for a real simple change. So let's first talk about mutation. So I don't have a computer science degree and I learned about object mutation the hard way. So I'm gonna run over this for people who maybe aren't familiar with the concept of mutation. So this is classic object assignment, right? I've declared person number one, I've set that equal to an object. Now I've declared person number two and I've set that equal to an object. And when I console log person number one exactly equals person number two, that returns true. And that's what I would expect, right? Because right here, I've said that person number one should equal person number two. So when I console log out person number one and person number two, we can see that they indeed have the same properties. So they should be equal, right? Uh, but then when I go and mutate the name property on person number two, and mutate is just a fancy word for change, right? I've made a change to the property. And then I console log out person number one and person number two, you can see that I've actually changed the name property on both objects. And that's because back here where I declared person number one, the computer actually just declares this object in memory. And then it hands person number one the reference to this object. So when I declare person number two, it hands person number two the reference to the same object that person number one has. That means when I go here and I change the name property on person number two, on person number two, what I've actually done is it's gone and pulled the object that's referenced by person number two and mutated that name property. So everything that shares a reference gets mutated when I mutate a property on an object. So how do we get around these shared object references? It's simple functions, right? So the S and the F. 
simple functions. Uh, here's a simple function. This is an arrow function. Uh, it's called get person. And when I invoke this function, it's going to return an object with a name and an age property. So I'm going to declare person number one and person number two, and I'm going to set them each equal to the return value of the get person function. Now they're going to have the same values, right? They're both going to be name PJ age 52. So I would expect when I console log that, that that might equal true, but it actually equals false. And again, that's because they have different object references and the JavaScript comparator is actually just looking at the object reference. It doesn't do a deep comparison of the objects. So when I mutate the name property on person number two in this case, you can see it does not affect person number one. So we're getting somewhere, right? What about an injectable function? Because we said ciphers mean simple injectable function. Now we're kind of playing fast and loose with the name, the word injectable here, but if we actually just put like parameterized, it wouldn't make word sense as a word. Uh, so we're just gonna call this injecting parameters into this function. So we take, get person, and instead of it just being an arrow function that doesn't take parameters, we're going to send in a name and an age. And whatever name and age we're going to send in, we're going to wrap that in an object and return that out. So once again, we can set our variables to equal the return value of this function. And again, that returns false, because remember, now they have two separate object references. And again, mutating the name property does not change the other object, even though they have the same values to start with again, because they do not have that shared object reference. So it turns out, though, we can write functions that return anything. Um, so here's an example of a function that returns two classes, right? So I want an object that has a person and a cat inside of it. So I go ahead and invoke this function here and under test. When I console log that out, I've got an object. And inside of it is a property called person and pretend this is the person object, and I've got a property called cat, and pretend this is that cat object, right? So it can return anything, including classes. So this is actually the basis of Cypher's testing. We're going to create a an simple injectable function that can take in whatever state we need to pass into it, and it's going to return to us brand new object references for everything we need for our tests. So it's going to return um, new references to service mocks, variables, and the actual class itself. So when every test gets its own object references, this eliminates the possibility of bleed through between tests. There's no more hunting to find where the variable is mutated. And test data is defined where the tests are happening. So uh, the great thing, what I really like about the setup function is that uh, really, the only way for me to declare an object is either in the actual test itself, and then I pass it into the setup function, or it actually gets instantiated inside the setup function and handed back in the return value. So let's talk a little bit about classic JavaScript test setup. Uh, so this is straight from the React docs. I took a screenshot. Right, So this goes ahead and declares a container variable. And you'll notice this is in the global scope of the test. right? And then that container gets referenced here in the before each, where it's actually instantiating the, um, the element under test. And then it's actually referenced again in this after each. And the reason there's an after each here is because, and this is straight from the React docs, we want to execute the cleanup even if a test fails. Otherwise, tests can become leaky and one test can change the behavior of another test, right? So we're actually having to run complete functions to clean up after ourselves when we share these object references. And I want you to notice with the before each, it is it is just a function, but it's, it's a void function. So it's not actually returning anything. So that's why we have to scope uh, any variables we use inside the before each outside of the before each in the global scope of the test. So here is an auto-generated Angular component test. Um, so I just ran, I created a new Angular component with the CLI, and this is the test it automatically generated for me. Once again, we've got a component and a fixture that are declared outside, of, like in the global scope of the test. Those are being referenced in the before each. And then you'll notice in our it block, our test block, we're referencing that same shared variable, right? So every single it block is going to use that same component. So the problems with the before each are that variables must be declared outside of the before each block. So we saw that in those example test setups, right? And that means the test will share variables with the same reference, which means that we've opened the door to mutation. 
Um, there can also be multiple before each block. I've personally written quite a few that are nested fairly deep inside the scribes, right? Because it turns out you can put probably 15, 20 before each block if you want, and it'll just keep running every single one of them before every single test. It runs before each. It kind of doesn't care how many there are. Um, before each blocks also run whether the test fails or not. And that's where that after each block comes in. So when you're sharing references to variables in your tests, you have to remember to clean up after yourself because you may end up with state bleeding between your tests otherwise. Um, so let's actually see a very simple mistake that can cause hours of frustration. So um, here's a code example I wrote. Um, and here is a link. I will provide this link at the end of the talk. Um, but if you click on this link, I'm going to click on it. It actually takes you to uh, this very simple application that I made that just has a couple different examples of unit testing. So I'm going to actually go to my code editor so we can run this thing. So here is the a classic setup, right? It's got our before each. So this is an Angular uh, application. Angular is the thing, the framework I prefer. Um, but this is very similar to uh, React setup. So let's go ahead and run this. There we go. I'm going to run this, and we'll see that it passes. Um, you'll also notice we've got two before eaches. So I've got a find on it. So we've got two before eaches. One where it sets it up where we're actually getting a cat back from the service, and one that sets up when we're not getting a cat back from the service. And all my tests are passing, so that's great. Um, I'm actually using the Angular testing library here. Um, it's set up as very similar to uh, testbed, but I feel like I get better error messages out of it. And it's easier for me to test through the public API of Angular. So I can actually test the uh, template variables a little more simply by using the screen object. Um, so anyways, I'm going to close these render objects for now. Um, so we can see that test pass, right? So over here, Go to the next slide if you want to. So this is a very, there's a very simple mistake here that's going to cause these tests to fail. So I'm going to run these tests here. So this is my failed component. Uh, so I'm just running it. I'm using just test runner. It's a plugin available with VS Code. And so you can see I'm getting a failure now. And if I look at this, it's saying it's unable to find the element app component catlist item underscore misty. And what I'm looking, and then when it actually, this is what I like about the React, uh, Angular testing library, is it actually shows me what got rendered out. And so what got rendered out is Frank. And so if we look at this setup here, in the global scope of the test, I've set the name, I've declared the name uh, variable and set it equal to Misty. So at the global level, the, uh, the, the tests have access to the name variable at this level. But in the before each, I accidentally re, uh, redeclared it here. So redeclaring it inside the before each means that everything in the before each is using this version of it. So if I take this out real quick here, now I'm going to run these tests again. We will see. Huzzah, our tests are passing. So as you can see, that's a very easy to make mistake. And I have personally tracked down this error many times. So that's one of my un, uh, least favorite parts about uh, the old school way of sharing variables, right? Um, so using ciphers, we don't have any more, there's no more possibility of redeclaring the variable because ciphers tests have self-contained scopes, right? So it's impossible to redeclare it. Um, so why do we even have that before each step in the first place? Well, it turns out that there's a lot of setup that really should belong in a shared step, right? We want to mock our service dependencies. We want uh, a lot of times there's some minimum state required to actually instantiate the class and the actual instantiation of the class, right? Um, if I were to do this setup, and I could technically do this setup in every single test, if I were to do that, refactoring would become a nightmare, right? So if we can isolate our setup into a single setup function, that makes refactoring a lot easier. So that's another advantage of ciphers testing because you no longer have more than one before each block. Um, you actually can just have one setup function and it can do everything. So ciphers accomplishes everything classic before each functions accomplish without the shared references. So what are the goals of ciphers setup? Well, it's to generate service dependency mocks, generate the minimum required state, and to instantiate the class. And if you remember back here, that's literally what belongs in the setup, right? 
So Cyphers is accomplishing the goals of the before each, but it's doing it in a slightly different way. Um, so this is a very, very basic setup function. Um, so I've got my setup function. You can see that it's taking in a name and it needs that to instantiate the service for some reason. And then I go ahead and I new up that service and I return it here uh, in this object. And so then down in my tests, this is how I would reference that. I will run this, I'll invoke the setup function and then I can destructure out whatever piece of that I want to test, right? Um, and so then I can run my test. So that's a very, very basic setup. Uh, let's look at a slightly more complex setup. So once again, we're gonna go back to this little app I made. And once again, here's a link to that repo if you'd like to clone that and run it yourself and kind of play around with it. So here we are in my VS Code, and this is my Cypher setup. The first thing I want you to notice is there are no before eaches in this setup. Um, we've got one setup function that's declared here, and then every single test will invoke the setup function. What I like about this is that I know what state I'm passing into this setup function. So I, I can actually sort of make it so that it automatically has enough state to render the component. So in this case, um, if I don't pass anything in, so if you notice in this test, I don't pass anything into the setup function, it will just actually uh, create a cat array for me. So I've got this create cat function that I've made. And it really just takes, uh, it takes the class, you can pass a partial object into it. So if I wanna overwrite any of these properties, I just pass it in as a partial object, which I do here with Misty. So I wanna make sure I know the name of the cat. So I pass in a partial object, it'll overwrite the name property of that cat. And then when I pass it into the setup, everything that gets built out will be built around this name Misty. So I can't do that mistake where I accidentally redeclare the variable inside the before each, right? Because it's actually passed straight into the function. So you'll notice in the function, I set up my cat service mock. Um, I use that in my provider array here in my render options. Um, and then I can return that out. So if I wanna do anything with this service, uh, service mock, so if I wanna, uh, if I wanna assert that it has been called, I can do that. And so I would do that like this. I would say const, um, and then I would destructure out that mock cat service, right? And that makes that available. It makes this instance of it available for me to use inside my tests. So really, that is Cyphers in a nutshell. Uh, this is sort of a short talk. I'd love to go more into it because I really am very passionate about this style of unit testing. But luckily for you, I have lots of great links. Um, so this is again, the link to the article by Moshe. Uh, it's a great article to read to get started. And then uh, Tim DeShriver has this really great article, Testing an NGRX Project. Not only is it full of great advice for testing NGRX, but it also follows a Cypher setup. Uh, so it has some more tips on that. And then as far as testing itself, I've got some links. So I've got a library link for Jest. Um, Jest is just a test runner. So I think default is Karma. Uh, I prefer Jest because it doesn't require a browser to run. Um, it has some great plugins that work with VS Code. And then I want to point out this Jest Autospies library. If you do any asynchronous testing at all, you should definitely check out Jest Autospies. Uh, this is Shai Resnick's library. It's been extremely, uh, extremely great. We use this at Cisco. We love it. Um, and if you do any testing of observables, definitely check out Observer Spy. I swear you will never need to test marbles again. Um, and then this is my code example. And then um, in GitHub. And then this is also another real quick example of how to create a um, how to create just sort of a, a test data generation factory, right? So it takes in a partial object and you can overwrite any property to easily create test data um, in whatever state you need it to be. So that is all I have for you today. Um,